Well, after a rather scary two weeks for me personally, I'm back and we're starting our new series where we're looking at the top 10 stories from Genesis. This week, we're in Genesis chapter one. If there's one passage in the Bible that's gonna get you into trouble teaching on, it's Genesis chapter one. There are so many different positions taken on this passage, and some of those who hold these positions can be very aggressive in defending their views. Having said that, let's dip our toes into the water and go for a short swim. You're watching Caffeinated Bible, and if this is your first time to this channel, I would love it if you subscribed and gave it a big thumbs up and let your friends know about it as well. I've been teaching seminary and been doing theological research for the past 20 to 30 years. And the goal of this channel is to bring that to you on YouTube. Now I mentioned in my update video where I talked about my health problems over the past week that I had to bump my giveaway for the Net Bible up to this week. And it has been a difficult selection to pick out one person to receive this. There's two that really caught my attention. John wrote, currently I'm going through Catechism of the Anglican Church. A few weeks ago we were discussing the Trinity and I liked how the Net Bible's textual notes of John 1 explained pros, that this infers nearness, but also a personal relationship. Charles Hubbard wrote, he said, in using the Net Bible, I examined the whole chapter one. This took over an hour and I enjoyed what was discussed on John 1.14 and looking at the Greek word translated. Also in John 3.16 as only begotten and it actually only means one of a kind or unique. Charles, for anybody who spends an hour looking through a suggestion that I had about winning this, you definitely get my vote for winning the Net Bible. I will put my email address in the show more section underneath this video. Please get in contact with me, send me your mailing address, and I will get this off to you as soon as possible. One of the fundamental principles of interpretation is that every text is an answer to a question. And if you really want to understand what that text is about, then you need to know what questions that author was addressing or attempting to answer. All too often when we study Genesis chapter one today, we're concerned about questions about evolution or the Big Bang. The problem is, is that these are the questions that we ask today, but they would have never entered the minds of the ancient Israelites. Rather, we need to look at this text and see what are the questions that the text is answering or attempting to address. Almost all conservative scholars agree that the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, were written somewhere between 1400 to 1100 BC, depending on how you date and when you date the Exodus from Egypt. These books are understood to have been written at the very end of the 40 years of the wandering in the wilderness, or shortly after they entered into the Promised Land. So what would the ancient Israelites be asking or need to know from these texts? Well, they're probably asking questions about who is their God, especially in compared to other gods from the other nations. Who are they as a people? Where do they come from? What do they believe? What is their history? The Pentateuch as a collection of five books answers these questions and a number of other questions as well. Now, the temporal flow of the five books is very important to this as well. If we sketch this out, we can see that in Genesis 1 through 11, this covers from creation up to the Tower of Babel, or from eternity past up to the Tower of Babel. These chapters hit the big ideas and big themes. Creation, man's problem in the world, sin, God's judgment, the rise of the nations, language. And they all set the stage for chapter 12, 
when Abraham as the father of Israel comes on the scene. As such, the first 11 chapters of Genesis serve as a prologue. They provide the framework to what follows afterwards. Now notice, starting in Genesis chapter 12, all the way up to the very end of the book, this narrative time frame or this narrative pace really slows down. Now the focus is on four people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, or about 100 to 150 years compared to eternity past in the first 11 chapters. Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers then slow down even more. Now the focus is on the 40 years of Israel wandering in the wilderness under Moses' leadership and their entering into this covenantal relationship with God and all that that means. When we hit Deuteronomy, the pace slows down to that of a snail. In the previous three books, God gave the law to Israel. In Deuteronomy, we have a three-part summary or recounting of the covenant. Or another way you could put it is we have three sermons from Moses about Israel's relationship to covenant and how the people are to follow it. In chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, we're told that Moses wrote this law and gave it to the Israelites. Deuteronomy 31 verse 9. Now the question is, what are they talking about there? Are they talking about the five books? Are they talking about Deuteronomy? Or are we talking about a summary of the law? Or are we actually talking about the legal precepts? We're not sure. But the key thing is, this is the most explicit reference to authorship of any book in the Old Testament. Turning our attention to Genesis, one way to look at the book of Genesis is to see its structure around this Hebrew word, Tadot. Usually this is translated as the generations of. Perhaps a better way to translate this would be as the story of or the history of. This is found at several places throughout the book of Genesis. In Genesis 2-4, we have the Tadolth of the heavens and the earth. In 5-1, we have the Tadolth of Adam. 6-9, that of Noah. 10-1, of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In 11-1, now we go to that of Shem. In 11-27 through chapter 25, we have the Tadolth of Terah. In chapter 25, we have the Tadolth of Ishmael. And then starting in chapter 25 through chapter 35, we have that of Isaac. Then 36, we have that of Esau. And then we turn to the Tadolth of Jacob that closes out the book. Now, the first Tadolth really occurs in Genesis 2-4, but Genesis chapter 1 could properly be understood as one of these accounts or the generations of, or perhaps to see it as a prologue. Now, Genesis chapter 1 introduces the three big players in the Bible, God, creation, and humanity as part of creation. So let's jump into the particular text itself now. Now, I'm not going to read all of Genesis chapter 1 because it would take too much time up in the video here. I try and keep these nice and condensed. So grab your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 1, and you can follow along. In Genesis 1-1, we are told that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sounds pretty straightforward in English, but immediately we run into problems. There are two dominant strains of thought for how to interpret verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. The first view is, is that Genesis 1 and 2 refer to the very inception or the creation of the world. The problem with this view is that verse 2 contains three disjunctive clauses that break the flow from verse 1 to verse 3. These three clauses are as follows. The first one is, Now the earth was without shape and empty or formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the watery deep, and the third is, but the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. These three clauses disrupt the flow of thought from verse 3 and make it difficult to read 1-1 as the very inception of the universe or the very start of creation. Some interpreters, though, read verse 2 as evidence that between verse 1 and verse 2, something took place and the result was is that God started creation again because now the earth is formless and void. The second way to read this is to see verses 1 and 2 as a summary statement about everything that's going to take place in Genesis chapter 1. 
It serves as a bookend to the seven days of creation and Genesis 2, 4, where it says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, is the second bookend of this passage. It sets it apart as a complete whole. This is very typical within biblical stories. Now, given the highly structured and repetitive nature of this chapter, which I'll get to here in a moment, I personally lean to the second view, that verse 1 is a summary statement of this entire chapter in a snapshot. The rest of the chapter is now going to zoom into greater detail of what verse 1 talks about. The other thing that's important to notice is that it starts off with, in the beginning, God created. Now, one of the things that this chapter is attempting to answer is, who is our God, especially in relationship to other gods? And as opposed to the polytheism or the various gods that are associated with some aspect of the created order, storms, water, land, fertility, various things like this, God creates all these things and he stands above them in Genesis 1. It lays the foundation for the monotheism that is going to develop within Israel. The use of this verb create or bara in the Hebrew is used only within the Hebrew Bible in reference to God. Humans can make something or form something or build things, but only God creates. This is the verb that is used in the following chapter about all of God's creative activities in the first six days of creation. Now let's take a look at the structure of Genesis 1 because this is important. The entire chapter here follows almost a poetic format, but it's not laid out like a psalm in stanzas. Rather, it is structured by repeated ideas, phrases, and words, and it's organized around a four-part pattern. What I would suggest is grab your Bible and grab four different colored highlighters or four different colored colored pencils and highlight these passages so that you can see this as we go through. The first idea that is repeated is God said. It's a divine speech act. And so you can go through and perhaps color that green every time you see that as you go through this passage. The second idea that we see here is this phrase or this clause, and it was so, or there was. This really shows the fulfillment of what God said, his utterance. The third repeated idea throughout this passage is, and it was good. It gives an evaluation of what just God said and took place as good. And then finally, each day concludes with an evening and morning. This gives a concluding sequence to each of the six days. Now the seventh day is going to break this structure here. That gives attention or prominence to the seventh day of creation. Okay, so let's go back to verse two. This is the one with the three disjunctive clauses I was talking about earlier. Now the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the water, but the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. There's no explanation at all offered within the text here as to why the earth starts off as formless and void. The key point here I want to bring out, though, is in almost every language, this idea of formless and void or darkness are used to represent chaos, evil, loss, or death. The same is true throughout the Old Testament. The big theme running through Genesis 1 here is that God transforms this lifeless chaos and the darkness of the primordial earth into creation that is ordered and filled with life. In other Near Eastern religions, the deep or the depths of the ocean represent one God and the fresh water another. For example, in the Babylonian religions, Marduk, one of the gods, killed the goddess Tiamat the water goddess, and used her body to create the heavens and the earth. He split her like a fish into two parts. Half of her he set up as a cover, as the sky. He stretched out her hide and posted guards, and he ordered them not to let her waters escape. As opposed to that, here there are no gods present. God brings order out of this chaos. This idea I was saying earlier that one of the prevailing themes throughout this chapter is how God brings order and life out of something that is chaotic and void of life at the very start runs throughout the Old Testament. 
We can see this in Isaiah 45, 18. God did not create the universe as a chaos, but he formed it to be inhabited. In verses 3 through 13, we get the first three days of creation. In verse 3, on day 1, light is separated from darkness. In verse 6, day 2, the waters are separated, with the waters below the expanse and the waters above an expanse. And then in verse 9, the waters below the expanse are separated from dry land, and plant life appears on the land. So let's go back to verse 3, day 1. Let there be light. While this text is talking about natural light, throughout history this passage has been interpreted according to some very basic metaphorical correspondences. You need light to see. You need light to understand something. You sleep when it is dark. And when you die, you no longer see but are in darkness. So light represents God and God's revelation, goodness, blessing, purity, truth, and life. There was evening and morning the first day. This is the end of the first day here, and notice these phrases I was talking about, evening and morning, that I repeated here. And notice the way a day is counted. Evening and then morning. This sets up the Jewish view of a day as running from nightfall to nightfall of the next day, which introduces a very profound spiritual reflection. If one day ends when the sun goes down and a new day begins at the start of that nightfall, then when we wake up in the morning, we're entering into a day that is half over already. We are entering into a day that God has been working and preparing already. We don't start it when we wake up. We join into this cycle halfway through it. And this should give us some pause here and help us to reflect upon our participation with what God is doing within the world. He doesn't wait for us to wake up. We enter into what he's already been doing for 12 hours. In verse 6, we have the start of the second day. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. This expanse here could also be translated as canopy or firmament. And the idea here is that of a vault or a dome or a separation between the waters below and the waters above. The waters are now organized or separated between the water that is below and the water that is above. This is not the same as the Babylonian myths of Marduk and Tiamat. Rather, God has ordered this. He has separated the waters above and below. Then in verse nine, we have the third day. Let the waters be gathered together and let dry land appear. This is the third ordered sphere the separation of the waters from the dry land. With this verse, we not only see the order of creation coming in, land from water, but also a shift towards life. Now, in many ancient Near Eastern religions and other parts of the world, there were fertility cults. One particular god, who we'll see a lot in the Old Testament, Baal, was a fertility god that produced life in the spring. But Baal would either die or depart in the autumn and the crops and the plants would die. And then with the spring, this God would be revived or brought back to life by another God or religious ceremony, and life would come back to earth. Here in this passage, we see that's not the case. God spoke, the waters were separated, we had dry land, and life or plant life appears on earth. This is not the work of some foreign deity. God brought life to the earth. In verses 11 through 31, we have days four through six of creation. I was talking about how this passage is very highly organized. Now notice, if God organized and separated the three distinct spheres, light from darkness, the waters above and below, and then the waters from dry land in the first three days, now in the next three days, God is going to populate each one of those three spheres with life. There's another YouTube channel called The Bible Project, and they have a really nice animated video on Genesis chapter 1 showing the structure of the first three days and the second three days. And I'll include a link to that below this video so you can take a look at that. It's only like seven minutes long, but it's very good on the structure of the days within Genesis chapter 1. In verse 14, we have the fourth day. God says, let there be lights in the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars, 
Now God populates this sphere of light and darkness, or day and night, with the heavenly bodies. These heavenly bodies are not gods or signs to be followed. They are placed there by God to mark day and night and the seasons of life. Or another way we could put this, all things in heaven and earth have been created by God and are subject to God. In verse 20, we have the fifth day of creation. Let the waters swarm with living creatures and birds fly above. Just as the waters were separated and we have water below and water above the expanse, God now populates the waters with fish and the heavens with birds. Verse 22, God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. This is the same blessing that he's going to give to mankind as well. In Genesis chapter 1, God blesses both animal life in verse 12 and then human life in verse 28. And on the seventh day, all parts of creation are said to be good. All of creation is wrapped in God's blessing and his goodness. In verse 24, or the sixth day, we have the statement, let the earth bring forth living creatures. On the sixth day, God populates the land with animals. Now mankind falls into this activity on the sixth day and he is part of creation alongside all the other animals, but at the same time differentiated from them as well. We see this in verse 26, and let us make humankind or mankind in our image. Now man is the final act of creation, but integral and within the entire story of creation. We are not above or below the created order, but part and parcel of it. All too often, this verse is read as an endorsement that we are above creation, that we can do what we want with it. But that misses the whole structure of the story. Man is created, bara, the same way everything else is. We are given emphasis as the last element, but it is most likely because the author wants to see us in our relationship to God and the rest of creation within the story of Genesis. At the same time, we are given a special relationship within this creation. We are created in God's image. We also have a purpose, to subdue and have dominion. Now within this passage, the emphasis is on God's good created order, his blessings and bringing order out of chaos, light out of darkness. And we need to interpret this subdue and dominion not as some sort of economic terms that we have to exploit the earth, but within the context of this passage. As God's image bearers, we are to participate in this process of creation as his agents. We are to keep order. We are to bring light, blessings, goodness. Dominion here is not a license to do what we want in the world, but in the best sense it is a challenge and a responsibility to follow God's pattern of having order and blessing and goodness within the world. The Old Testament scholar Gerhard von Rad mentions that ancient kings would have statues of themselves set up throughout their kingdom to show that this was their domain and it was under their rule. God does the same thing in this passage here, only not with statues, but with human beings who are his image bearers. As we continue to read through Genesis, though, we're going to see how this idea of human beings being God's image bearer within the world is going to take a tragic turn and we're going to really bear the brunt of that even down to this day. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Now in chapter two, the first three verses, we have the seventh day of creation. And at this point, the pattern takes a change. These three verses are 35 words long. They break into five stanzas or sections of seven words each. The middle three sentences all have seven words in them each, and so you can see it is highly structured. So let me bring it up on the screen here for you. 2-1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished all his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his works 
that he had done in creation. Now notice how this is very poetic and repetitive in its nature. And it really brings out the idea here that God rests. Why? Because all of creation is done and it is good. And the repetition of the seventh day here sets up the Sabbath that is so important later on in the Jewish religion. When we tie this in with the account of creation, the Sabbath then reminds us on a weekly basis that we are part of creation, that we are God's property because he created us on the sixth day and he rested on the seventh and blessed that day. Summary. The prologue or the first to do it, we see God bringing light into darkness. He separates darkness from the deep, symbols of chaos, and he brings about fertility on the land, plant life. He appoints times and seasons to life and existence and also worship. He blesses creation. He creates human life in his image. God brings order and life to what was formless and void. Goodness in chapter 1, this idea of good is used in verses 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31. And in the garden in the next chapter, they're going to be tempted with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in chapter 4, God instructs Cain to do what is good. The sovereignty of God is also emphasized throughout this passage. Everything that exists was made by God, hence under his authority. In the ancient world, there were gods for almost all aspects of the created order. Some good, some evil. The sun, the moon, the stars, storms, rivers, animals, wind, all these things were seen as under the control of a different deity by different religions. So Genesis chapter 1 would have been an earth-shaking document to read back then. Alan Ross has written an excellent commentary on Genesis. It's pretty thick. It's about 600 pages long. But in relationship to Genesis chapter 1, he writes that God, by his powerful word, transforms the chaos into a holy and blessed creation. For the ancient Israelites who are wondering about their relationship to God and other gods and other nations, this text has a very, very powerful message. If God made all things, is before all things, blesses all things, it would mean that there are no gods beside him. And it would be utter foolishness to worship other gods or images of God. I hope you've enjoyed this very, very quick and superficial skim through Genesis chapter 1. This is one of these passages that you could spend years studying. And give it a thumbs up if you like the video. Next week, we're going to go into our second video in the top 10 stories in Genesis, and we're going to look at the garden that is in Eden and Adam and Eve. So until then, peace.